next we have um, Chris, and he's he served in Afghanistan for 15 months, so he's seen everything firsthand. He knows exactly what goes down, and he's going to give you his insights on what really happens in this so-called uh, war for, for freedom or war against terrorism. Chris. Hi, everyone. Salam alaikum. I wrote this last week, uh, the same day as the massacre happened. Uh, and, and when I read the news that day, I, it was hard to deal with it. And I finally decided I needed to put, put all my thoughts down on paper and speak out against this atrocity. Uh, sorry. But uh, yeah, I, I wrote this last week when I found out about the massacre. And uh, I just wanted to share it with you all today. I was barely 15 when 9-11 happened. I was a patriotic, patriotic American, if you will. I had family members who had served in former wars. I was in the cadet program during my high school, and I cared deeply about the military in my country. I believed what I was told about Afghanistan, and then later Iraq. I had no reasons to question my leaders. I, it didn't even cross my mind. I joined the Army a few weeks after the invasion of Iraq, as soon as I was legally old enough to join, two weeks after my 17th birthday in September of 2003. My mother had to sign my permission forms to enter. After high school, I attended my initial Army training, which was infantry and parachute training, and I came back to my home in New Jersey and worked as a recruiter. As the time went on, the evident mistakes over the Iraq War were ever-present, and each month presented new lies and atrocities, along with the reality that we screwed up, so what are we going to do now? Even then, the U.S. was still part of a good war in Afghanistan, right? After my recruiting duty and a brief period of college under the tuition assistance program, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division as a parachute infantryman in 2006. By mid-2006, my newfound recon infantry unit was being prepped for a 15-month deployment to Afghanistan. During this time, the situation in Iraq was utterly deteriorating, and U.S. forces were losing more people each week than the week presiding. However, my unit took a little bit of solace in the fact that we were going to fight the better war, if there is such a thing. Time stopped for me in January of 2007 when I, along with my unit, de deployed to the tribal regions of Afghanistan along the Pakistani border, and we spent 15 months as part of the ground war. I returned from Afghanistan four years ago this April, April 8th to be precise. What I had witnessed during my segment of missing time propelled me to eventually leave the U.S. military behind in a mid-level management position as a sergeant and as a person who would look forward to military service my entire life. During my missing year, I was part of extreme missions, 30 to 40 days on end, living in our trucks or just living in the local wo uh, woodland areas. We were part of seek and destroy missions, uncovering the enemy by uh, building a temporary presence in local villages and trying to root them out. Uh, every so often, we would re receive fire only to return it. And other times, we would do what we called recon by fire, just firing randomly into different areas to see if somebody would fire back at you so that you had a reason to engage. I'm ashamed, to sh I'm ashamed to say we called it come out, come out wherever you are. Our presence in most areas was for 30 days or so before there was a new mission to take part in. We stayed in an area long enough to stir it up and then eventually left. And, we, and that, after leaving an area, after stirring them up, you pretty much guarantee that the next unit who comes in is going to be engaged in combat. By the time the ground war got serious to us, we had already been there for seven months. To spare you a side tangent, I've known six men to be taken from the world in combat, but the losses on the Afghan side are, are far more, far more outweigh our losses, and it's not right. We had the ability to always cry foul or claim that we were scared for our lives, even when men would shoot at cars out of fear or when, when our rounds landed in the wrong backyard. We were, after all, being commanded by the same people who had made such devious errors in the U.S. war against Iraq. What I found in my service was an escalation of war powers. I didn't find an easy win, as the news would tell you, and I didn't find us promoting democracy or human rights. I found a situation where both the occupier and the occupied cannot justify our foreign presence. With each battle or attack, we saw more reasons for the U.S. and NATO forces to get mad about our being there and being forced into an action. And our anger showed itself in the worst forms during our retaliation periods. What I, what I found was a war that was guaranteed to do only one thing, escalate. Each year we fight, we rile up more and more people with the unlimited resources of bullets, armor, Humvees, and bombs, along with Dairy Queen restaurants and Subway restaurants at all the largest air bases. This war was about money and sustainment. There's too much money to be made. 
I left that system four years ago, and even though I've been scared to speak out, given how the U.S. government treats whistleblowers, there's a time where you cannot be silent anymore. For a system that demonizes whistleblowing, but allows those guilty of war crimes to walk free, I say, damn you. Damn you. Damn you. Bradley Manning sat in solitary confinement and is now awaiting a possible lifelong prison sentence, while the U.S. Marine Corps sergeant found guilty in the Haditha murders walks free. I can no longer be silent of a hypocritical system, no matter what they be able, what, no matter what they may be able to do to me for speaking out. Everything my unit did during 2007 to 2008 proved to me that we weren't, we weren't there to win it. We were only there for a body count. That was the only way that we could claim victory. I cannot tell you how many bags of rice, beans, clothing, cases of water, etc., were not handed out to the local populace unless we got too gun happy, we screwed up, or we shot the wrong thing. We weren't there winning hearts and minds. In our minds, it was all payback. And that was when there was only 20,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. The men who led me were those who got away with some extreme stuff in Iraq, so they knew exactly how to cover stuff up and fill out paperwork. Many of them are family men of their own, and they're only trying to guarantee having a career to support their own families. But everything I experienced in the past doesn't surprise me when I hear these hor horrific tales nowadays. From the kill team, to the urination videos, to the drone bombings of civilians, to the reckless murders from Iraq to Afghanistan, it's all the same. Even then, I wasn't even close to the horrible reality of the situation we heard about last weekend. But to me, it proves that the escalation of war has continued, and will continue, until we all stand up against this nonsense international venture. Again, having been scared of public protesting in the past, it matters, it matters not to me anymore. There's other war resistors in Canada who, like myself, when we recognized something was horribly wrong, we did what we needed to in order to distance ourselves from it. We knew we had no answer to the drastic situations in front of us. All we could do is not take part in it anymore. Our only question is who will be the last person killed in this atrocious war? When will we accept our screw-up and finally leave? The anti-war movement since pre-Afghanistan and pre-Iraq all the way up to the present day has said the same thing, that war is not the answer. War destroys all of those involved until there is no recourse other than to abandon all hope. All of us who tote the message that war is wrong is correct and they have been correct since the beginning. I've seen enough by my own eyes as a former believer in the necessity of war in order to, enough to change my own, entire opinion on it. We've all seen the errors of this occupation, and the worst part is, as long as people on both sides justify it, we're only gonna see a rise in sentiment and violence. I served as part of a well-armed and well-armored force of 20,000 over four years ago. There are now 100,000 military serving in, in Afghanistan today. We watched. We watched the atrocities in Iraq continue after the surge, and we've seen all of those soldiers moved from Iraq into Afghanistan. The atrocities will continue while we continue to deploy people who cannot comprehend their own presence in a foreign land, while we pay no mind to the population therein. Out of vengeance and retribution alone, we will continue to see these horrible, uh, these horrible acts of violence. What happened in the last week by a rogue unit or rogue soldier depending on however the news, whatever the news ends up telling us it is, is nothing different than what we've seen in the past. It is the pointless escalation of war to no resolve. Ultimately, we reap what we sow. I'm glad I'm not a part of it anymore, but I weep for those lost within the nonsense on all sides. War is a disease, and I cannot express enough regret for having been part of one and waging war against the proud peasant people. And to the U.S. Consulate, I tell you this, I'm damn proud of my heritage and my family, but, and I was glad to wear this uniform in the past. But I don't work for you anymore. I experienced the lies firsthand, and I did something about it. I work for a backward system. I've known, men, I've known great men who perished in this war that can be doing a lot to unite us all right now. I'm sick of, sick of old men sitting around in air-conditioned rooms cooking up new wars for young men to die in. Trust me, I have a lot of atonement to seek in life, but being quiet does not justify being quiet. I'm glad to help combat veterans of the U.S. wake up and leave the system just as much as I am proud to reconcile with those who, who I've wronged so much. We may not be able to bring back any of, the, any of those lost, but we can guarantee the end of this war, and that's by uniting and demanding that it ends. I'm going to the board on my chest out of sheer ignorance alone. I can't sit by and watch this insanity unravel any longer.
War crimes need to be punished. No justice, no peace. As a famous general once said, I hate war only as a soldier who has lived it can. Only as one who has seen its brutality, its futility, its stupidity. End this war. How many more? Thank you. I've been asked to bring up an event tomorrow night, uh, an organization I'm part of, the War Resistor, uh, War Resistor Support Campaign. We're doing a, uh, a movie showing tomorrow night at uh, 25 Cecil Street at United School. War Resistor. Uh, War Resistors are people like myself. Uh, we've served overseas or served in the U.S. military. And once, the, we, didn't, we didn't want to be part of any war crimes, so we went AWOL and did what we needed to to leave that system. And we're seeking refuge in Canada. Uh, I myself, I've been here about three and a half years, but we have people going back to uh, 2003 was the earliest when people started coming up to Canada. And Harper and his goons in Parliament have been working behind the scenes to try to kick us out because they don't like us speaking the truth about what's really going on overseas. But we're going to be having an event tomorrow night. Uh, if anybody's interested, I'm sure you could uh, work it out with Afghans for Peace. Uh, they can link you to it. And thanks for listening, everybody. I appreciate it. Divided we will fall.